So let's take a let's take a step back for people listening to this because we're really trying to get back to kind of the next generation. And there's probably some college students or people maybe trying to get into the industry or learn about the industry. What is MEP? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> a broad question. Good point. <laughs> Basically, the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing trades. Uh, some people throw fire protection as its own thing or in with the, the P part of that. Um, but all the stuff that sparks or spins, I say in class, that's the stuff I'm good at. Um, and I, well, go ahead. I said, or is wet. Or is wet, yeah. Yeah. So, and from a total project perspective, you can see anywhere from 30 to 50% of a project budget that's hit by this stuff that's not the building. It's the systems that help make the building work at the end of the day. Or in- Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the CM Mentors Podcast. My name is Matt Graves. My co-host each week is Kyle Grandel. What's going on, Kyle? Hey, how you doing, Matt? Doing great. Thanks. Good, man. Hey, we got a real cool guest this week, uh, Brian Bichek. Uh, he's coming on. He's a professor at Fair State University. Did I get that yep. right? Yep. And he's wanting to come on and uh, talk specifically about MEP. Uh, we haven't really talked much about the MVP, really any trades so far on this podcast. So we kind of wanted to dive in and MEP. And um, I know me and Kyle both have MEP backgrounds of some flavor. So this should be a fun conversation. Uh, Brian, you want to give us a little bit of background on yourself? No, uh, sure. Uh, thanks again for having me on too, by the way. Um, yeah. A little background about myself. Uh, I'm a professor at Ferris State University and um, have two kids and uh, a wife. Uh, Kyle actually has done a little a couple projects with her. Mm-hmm. Uh, she works for General Mills. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. Frogging my throat. But uh, yeah, and I teach a lot of the MEP courses at Ferris State, um, along with some power and process plant, because that's my other background. Before I started teaching, I worked for uh, a power cooperative in Michigan uh, on their generation side of things. So that's a little bit about myself, engineering background from education, uh, but Michigan Tech. What got you into construction, Brian? Um, uh, boy, probably all the way back. My dad, he was an electrician. He was IBW electrician for yeah seven years now we're talking. yeah so that's I your about to ask you. you i was about to ask you which of the MEPs was your favorite but uh, it's electrical ask, i'm not gonna easy. ask the question after all yeah that. easy but answer. uh i was kind of a, a rebel and went for mechanical engineering for my Ooh. bachelor's degree so <laughs> went back later for my master's in electrical uh so kind of went back my dad's path there so that's <laughs> kind of where it all started um and then my first job out of college uh, it was kind of an engineering position, but a lot of project management with it as well. So that steered me towards that construction management side of things. We were doing a lot of uh, gas turbine retrofit kind of projects. So that was kind of the start of that. And by the end of my, call it working career before academia, we built a $230 million natural gas fired power plant. So that was kind of the, the big project that I left on and went to academia after that. What took you into academia from kind of, I guess, from the field into the college? Yeah, a couple things. One was probably as I was ramping up that big project, I had a lot more opportunities of for informal education, I'll say. We were doing monthly directors, or board of directors kind of presentations. And I found I really liked teaching them what we were doing out in the field. Um, it kind of started that way. And after that, I also did a lot of more formalized training for some of our operators of our power plants and really started to like that. The other side of things is two young kids at home and uh, I now have the summers off. So I've got two weeks left and I get to not work until the last week in August. So that is a huge benefit of that as well, just from a lifestyle change. Probably a busy couple of weeks, though, coming up. It is. They're, they're horrible weeks, but <laughs> we'll, we'll push through it. It's still nothing compared to, like, check out on a big project. So uh, it's not that bad. But uh, really, the driver was giving back, and I think I found kind of that purpose, if you will, of what I'm meant to do. I, I love being in the classroom and teaching students. That's really – I found it. So That's cool, man. So let's take, a, let's take a step back for people listening to this because we're really trying to get back to kind of the next generation and there's probably some college students or people maybe trying to get into the industry or learn about the industry. What is MEP? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> a broad question. Good point. Basically, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing trades. 
Uh, some people throw fire protection as its own thing or in with the, the P part of that. Um, but all the stuff that sparks or spins, I say in class, that's the stuff I'm good at. Um, and I well, go ahead. I said, or is wet or is wet. Yeah. Yeah. So, and from a total project perspective, you could see anywhere from 30 to 50% of a project budget that's hit by this stuff. That's not the building. It's the systems that help make the building work at the end of the day. Or even if you're not talking residential or commercial, more of an industrial process, it's probably a lot more than just 50% of that. Cause if I think back to my power plant days, uh, just about everything was under one of those three banners, M, E, or P. Oh, did you say something, Kyle? Oh, no, no, I wasn't. Good. Oh. <laughs> so that's kind of something I think a lot of college kids, too, you know, looking back on it, you know, when you get, you go through college and, you know, you, you go through, I did civil engineering, right? And I did civil engineering and it was a uh, specialization in construction management, which was really like one class your senior year. So it was like one scheduling class, one estimating class, one of everything, right? Um, and you start learning about these trades the construction trades you start learning about concrete and steel and structures and civil and those sort of things and i don't know i didn't do a civil or do a construction management class but i imagine too a lot of people they have the idea that construction is dirt and concrete and steel and a structure and building and bricks and like yeah what'd you say the percentage of the mep was like 50 percent? it can range from like 30 to 50 percent of the budget yeah yeah so it's like that's a huge chunk and a lot of people don't get any taste of it um right so I think it's and I'd say from like our students and they're coming in as freshmen, almost none of them have any background in the MEP side of things. A lot of them have swung a hammer, helped their dad frame up a deck or something like that. Um, but it's completely foreign to them. They take for granted when I flip on that light switch that lights come up there. They don't think about what's behind that system. Um, so that's one of my bigger hurdles is to get them to understand that not only are you you may have to look at a subcontractor who's doing this, but if you know more about this process and the stuff that goes into it, you're going to be an exponentially better construction manager if you know what it is you're supposed to be looking out for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I can speak on the manufacturing side, too, of things that going into existing plants, MEP is always where it seems to be the biggest mess. Um, yes. Because the existing systems that are running all over the plant, up in the interstitial space, up to the roof, back down, through the through the concrete and the floor, I mean, they get complicated really quick. And if you don't account for that, and if you don't really do the investigation into it and give it the attention, then your project's going to head for disaster. Yeah, and huge coordination issues there too between the three letters there, M E and P. Nobody likes to talk to each other in that group. It seems like on the job <laughs> yeah, that's side. definitely if true. The, the first one's in there. I'm going to run my plumbing and it's, forget about the electrician. Yeah, yep. I've seen. You know, a contractor they may do a mechanical and plumbing, right? And even those two trades don't talk or get along to each other. Like, yeah. you know, you're in the same office. Like, come on. Exactly. But I I will say we have a pretty good uh, selection of classes about technology in our program too. I'm not teaching those directly. One of my colleagues is, but we talk a lot about uh, how I introduce maybe some concepts. He's going to talk about technology wise when I'm doing my MEP stuff. Uh, because I think there's a lot of opportunity coming up as more and more companies are bringing in BIM models or whatever it is uh, for this coordination and to iron out a lot of those issues ahead of time. Yeah, the company I, work, I worked for, a mechanic, I was a project manager for a mechanical and plumbing subcontractor, and they were real heavy on the, I mean, they prefabricated as much as they could. And so they were real ahead in the BIM process, right? Um, even with projects that were, wasn't a contractual requirement for BIM modeling. They want to do BIM modeling and they push it into make sure everybody else did it as well. But just because they can get it coordinated, then they could use that and build a duct and prefabricate their piping and everything else and then send it up to the field. And it, it reduced a lot of the field risk, which is your labor, right? Yeah. It was pretty cool. I mean, how they would even do it for laying out, uh, you know, uh, deck structure hangers, you know, the little embeds that go into the, when you're pouring a concrete deck, laying all those out. They could put it into the Trimble machine and put them down and they know where all their hangers go. So they can just throw their all thread up and they start putting a pipe in. And it was a, when it worked well, it was really cool. But when something went wrong, it could go real wrong. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> but, made a change and it never got transposed to the drawings or yeah. 
Yeah, or you get all this stuff prefabricated. That was a problem too with the owners or the you know the architect, the engineers, and the owners or whoever. But you know you get all this stuff prefabricated. You may be prefabricated out for something that may not get installed. They haven't even poured the tenth level of the deck yet, but you've already got yeah. the pipe and the ductwork prefabricated. And they go start making changes, and you're like, you can change whatever you want to, but just to let you know, I've already got it built and it's sitting in my shop. So it's going to be you know it's not just making a few changes. This I got to redo all this. So your costs right. go up and up and up. So. Definitely. Keep in mind. Hey, Brian, um, I, I know that you teach a lot of different uh, different levels of students, you know, different different, uh, you know, grades, if you will, or, you know, experience levels as far as their education goes. And um, in those different classes, are you seeing, um, you know, big differences as far as trends for, for things that that are maybe important topics or, you know, kind of the hot button or the trends that, that you know, things that are that are these students are concerned about? Um, I, I haven't taught freshmen a little bit, but when I did there, they are just blank slates most of the time. Um, what they think they know about construction is what we talked about earlier, like maybe a backyard project at home. Uh, very few of them have understood the magnitude of what a large construction project can be. So they're just amazed by the sheer amount of information we throw at them that first year. Lately, actually, even our freshmen have been getting internships because the industry is just clamoring for warm bodies out there. So they're pulling in these interns as, you know, just after their freshman year. So then they're coming back and they've seen stuff out in the field. And now at sophomore level, they think they're experts because <laughs> they've been in the field now. So there's some of that, you start to open their eyes to maybe that third or fourth level now at the sophomore classes. And that's where a lot of my MEP classes are. And they've got some hands-on lab components with them. So I I let them experience maybe what they watch somebody else do on a job site, like sweat copper pipe. Um, so they get to do that in lab too. And then they realize, oh, there's a bit of an art to this. It's not just anybody can do that. Um, so I, I don't want to say it humbles them too much, but it actually, you know, resets their expectations. Um, their junior, they're, they're feeling pretty confident. And they get to their senior year and they start to think about, okay, what are my responsibilities going to be going into a full-time career now? And then I find they become a lot more inquisitive that senior year. Uh, that curiosity starts to branch out. I get a lot more questions in class for my senior classes. Um, so at that level, I'm teaching a construction economics class. Um, which I try and tie a little bit of personal finance into them too, because they're going to get out into the world for the first time. So that helps them out. And then the power and process plant construction class too, which is we're tackling basically big industrial stuff um, and how some of that commissioning and coordination can really change on a project like that too. So they're, they're, they're asking a lot. They're trying to say, okay, how can I use this actually in my job now? They're not just trying to get through the degree like they were in the younger years, maybe. Um, but from a trending topic, I would say technology keeps being the thing that comes up over and over again. Um, they sometimes are pushing us because companies are trying to adapt new things in the field all the time. And we're seeing what they're doing and then trying to reflect that in class to help prepare them. So that's a, a big thing I see. It's a push and pull between industry and education right now. Um, historically, you like to think that academia is the leader. In something like that, you know, you learn about it first and then construction companies are slow to pick that up. I would say the pace of companies adopting new technology is starting to rise pretty fast now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, kind of back to that MEP lab, that sounds really interesting. Can you expand a little bit on that and, and, and kind of what that looks like and some of the different things you guys are doing? Yeah. So I'll talk a little bit about how the two classes are laid out. Um, there's a mechanical construction practices class, and then there's a separate electrical class. Um, so each of those are a three credit class and they're split two hours a week lecture, two hours a week lab. Uh, but I'm lucky enough to have like a flexible block. We meet twice a week for two hours. Some days that's all lab. Other days we get into a lot more lecture topics, but it's usually not just me pointing at a screen up on the board. I've got cutaways of motors. I've got different samples of wire maybe or plumbing. I'm passing stuff around and it's a back and forth. So it's an interactive lecture. And then when we get to the lab piece, I'm trying to help them experience what it is we're learning about and then understanding what the tradesperson has to go through at the end of the day too. So a good example was the sweat and copper pipe one. Some other things we do is in the electrical class, 
will wire up like tabletop circuits so we understand the concepts of voltage and amperage and things like that. Then we'll take that and I've got a little mock structure in the back of the lab that'll actually wire up with Romex and some lights with three-way switches and that always throws them for a loop. You know, simple circuits, but it, it pushes their understanding of what uh, what's actually going on in the field. When they watch an electrician just do it out of habit versus um, them just struggling understanding why do i need that third wire here <laughs> so it's like i tell them i'm not trying to make them electricians i'm not trying to make them plumbers but if they understand what those people are doing they will be better construction managers 100 percent. i always say that to people is like whenever you're first starting off just go talk to the tradesman go talk to the yes. plumber go talk to the, you know go out in the field and you know don't bother him but you know a lot of times if you're if you're interested those guys will start talking to you and explaining what they're doing and yeah, that's you probably your, your biggest resource on a job site is those tradespeople. A hundred percent. Everybody loves to share what they do, and especially if you show the interest, and it kind of feeds off the energy, and then they get even more into it. You can yeah. watch that way. Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. So do y'all, you know, because really through construction management and stuff, there's kind of sort of two routes, right? You can kind of take the field route, the superintendent route, or kind of the office route, the project management route. Do y'all kind of specialize the students coming out of your program or is it you kind of just get a little bit of everything and then once they get out into the real world they kind of can pick one of those tracks yeah we don't specialize we give them a little bit of everything and it's really kind of up to the the student uh based on where they want to go um, whether they go more of a field or a, a, an office route but they're they are prepared to be an estimator to be a, a project engineer to be an assistant superintendent or really an assistant project manager when they're rolling out of school. Um, and we see uh, just about everybody, probably equal amounts into all those different career paths as they head out there. Um, some find that maybe they didn't really wanna be in the field and they switch over within their first couple of years out of school and we'll have some you know, the occasional email back to the professor saying, hey, you were right. I really wasn't <laughs> wanting to go this way, but I made the switch now. Um, but other people, they know exactly what they want and they go for it. Usually I see that more on the field side. The people who think they want to be in the field, they know that and that's where they stay. Do you see much of a trend where um, coming out of, out of school, they, they don't want to travel? I mean, do you see a lot of commonality there? Just because like, like when I was in engineering, for example, there was a lot of opportunity if you want to travel because engineers typically don't want to travel. They want to stay home. And so that's why I was always in the, in the field. That's what got me into doing construction management work. Um, in the first place. So I'm just wondering if, if you see a lot of that where it's like uh, they come out of school and they, you know, they're, they're thinking they want to be in the field, but it's like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to travel, which it could limit, you know, their opportunity, but, but maybe not depending on what they're going for. Yeah. Um, there are definitely students who don't want to, and they're, I would say it's 60, 40 students who don't really want to travel and 40% who really do. And, um, I see them tend to more self-selecting to what kind of companies they go to that way. Uh, the ones who don't want to travel a whole bunch, they're picking the more smaller, you know, maybe for me, Grand Rapids, Michigan contractors, regional contractors, and the ones who want to travel, sky's the limit. They're going nationwide. Uh, we have some students going for like a Kiewit or a, a Whiting Turner out of Baltimore, uh, Hensel Phelps, you know, all those hire a lot of our students and uh, they go all over the nation. So it's, I think the students who don't want to travel quite as much, it does limit their options on who they can get a job from. Um, and the ones who want to travel, it's wide open for them. Yeah, yeah well said. So. A minute ago, you were talking about you, you do a construction economics course. What you call yeah. It? What is that? What does that look like? Um, it's basically a how do you make decisions with money class on a job site is the big focus of it. but. Uh, from an engineering background, you might have had an engineering economics class. Uh, I know I did growing up through that. Uh, it's it's those uh, understanding compound interest, basically, and how do you plan out a, a cash flow time horizon and understand what that means and maybe in today's dollars so you can compare options apples to apples. So it's a, kind of that classic engineering economics. But if I throw the word engineering in there, students freak out. They don't like that. So we call it construction economics. Um, but like I said earlier, I'll also throw in some personal finance, like talk about retirement planning. Um, if you put 10 grand in the bank account today and let it grow at, for 40 years, what are you going to have at the end of that time? You know, those kind of calculations. And then it devolves into a lot more conversations about 
managing money on a job site and things like that. Oh, that's cool. You do, I guess you do yeah. budgeting and those sort of things. And yep, yeah, it's it's a capital budgeting kind of project class. Yep, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. What I did was yeah. uh, I did a business minor because you had to take I already take like three business classes through my program. You had to take like a finance, a, I think you had to do an accounting and you know, like a management course, and it was like take like three more classes. You got a minor, so it was a uh, yeah. I don't remember being specific to engineering economics but anyway yeah. okay. a, but still they, they still try to get you at least a little bit of stuff and you know it was all yeah. te textbook and it probably didn't apply to anything you're ever going to do in your real world because it was the one-on-one -on -one course through the business school so it, right you, you have a, a widget you're making in a manufacturing plant example or whatever it is yeah i'm trying yeah. to throw examples like hey you want to buy a skid steer which is the best skid steer to buy do you rent it do you own it do you lease it whatever it is so those are the decisions we kind of talk about that's so invaluable because like a lot of people you know don't get that really they right figure out the hard way <laughs> yeah yeah and like you were saying you had like one construction management class in your school right because you were an engineering background yeah you know taking like basically your senior year or last year and a half was construction management type courses where there was like a one scheduling class there was one course i can't remember what it was called but i think we just did we did a little bit of like what you might call like engineering economics it was like one course that was one semester broken up into three parts so you probably only had like two weeks or whatever three weeks in each yeah. section and i think part of that was economics part of it was uh like logistics and something else was you know it was a three i remember a three-part class but it, we burned through it so fast nothing i mean hell i can't remember what the class was called or what we did i remember it was just kind of a little bit of everything so yeah yeah and i remember my undergrad too it's like nothing i learned had anything to do with managing a project it was all about design engineering basically so when i get thrown on my first job I've got no idea what's going on, <laughs> you know, luckily I, you know, did a lot of say CAD work, but it was more like machine design CAD. So I at least knew, understood drawings and things like that. Um, but you're tons of on the job learning. Um, if I would have known there were programs like this construction management degree, it sets them up so much better than just a, a raw engineering degree for something like that. Um, but, you know, as any college program, you're never going to get a hundred percent of the stuff you need to know on the job. One, because there's only four years and, you know, you can learn a lifetime of stuff in construction. Mm -hmm. And two, every company is going to do something differently. So you're at least learning how to learn and you're getting the basics down at the end of the day. Let me ask you this, because this is kind of always my example. When I got out of school, I didn't know how to do anything. Was do you teach them what a submittal is and do you teach them how to ride an RFI? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even informally, like in my sophomore level classes, they... In the program, there's a class where they learn how to write RFIs and do submittals. I think we call it uh, construction administration or something like that. Um, but even in my class, before they get to there, like right now, the last three weeks of both the mechanical and electrical class, we do a big project at the end of it. So I make them do a material estimate um, before maybe they've even had estimating. It's a small scope because they're doing like a single circuit in a building. So it's a smaller scope, but they're going through the process. I give them a, a rough set of plans and a spec sheet, maybe not even a spec book, um, but I don't give them everything. And I tell them, you don't have everything you need to succeed. You have to go through this process called RFIs and I explain what all that is. And so they have to submit some. Um, some are not very good RFIs, others are really good. And I tell them why they are good or not because I kind of do it like an RFI meeting with the whole class and go through everybody's. Um, like, don't just ask me what to do. Tell me your solution and then ask me if it's acceptable kind of thing. So we do that. Um, and then at the end of it, they actually get to go wire up this stuff at the end of the class. Um, so like that will be all of next week for me. We have another class where they actually frame a building. It's basically a math class disguised as a hands-on framing lab. Um, so they learn all that angles and structural stuff. Um, so that house has been built and we go wire it and we go plumb it up. That's this project at the end of the semester. So the last two weeks they've been preparing for it. Next week they actually go get to install that stuff. That's pretty cool. They learn how to use a tape measure the right way. and Exactly. Uh, rafter tables and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. What, what is a tape measure? <laughs> what, what I, I, was, I was an electrician. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Take measures and brooms, man. We're going to teach them one day. That's right. I, I want nothing to do with either one of them. Uh, 
So, so I, I want to ask. Um, so, one of our first guests was Angelo, and 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 his topic was the human side of construction. And I was at uh, Western Carolina University the other week and talked with some students there, and they were also really into that topic. You know, the the human side of construction, really bringing in you know the the personal side of things into into our daily lives on job sites. Do you do you see much of that going on in, in, in your school, Brian, as, as far as like the focus of the students and things you guys are bringing into your curriculum? And I mean, what, what do you see in there? Anything? Yes, quite a bit. Um, historically, we've had two classes that kind of touch on that. One's an ethics and professionalism in construction that we've had for a long time. And the other is our capstone course. So at the end of the their careers, they have one course where they go through the entirety of a, a project. This year, I think they did one on a wastewater treatment facility. Um, so a lot of the lecture material there, they're trying to bring in some of those soft skills, presentation yeah. skills, and that human dimension. But beyond those two kind of historical classes we've had, we're pushing into our curriculum like a dedicated soft skills course too. Um, to understand that this is a relationship business at the end of the day. You can know as much as you want about the building, but if you can't get the people to do what you need to do to get that building built, it's worthless. Um, so there's that soft skills piece. And actually, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, he is also a registered therapist or licensed therapist, and he's talking a lot about mental health in construction too yeah. um, in our program. Uh, so that's been a, a big topic that's been in the news lately. I know a lot of the construction magazines have been talking a lot about that too. Um, so we're trying to push a lot of that to our students too, to say, hey, you got to take care of yourself along with this too, because we can run some very long hours under a lot of pressure and uh, uh, you can do some unhealthy things to cope with that. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, that's absolutely right. And, and as we all know, I mean, times have changed a lot, too. I mean, in the last 10 years since, since I was actually using my hands for work, um, I mean, things are just different now. I think, you know, the old school mentality and the, uh, you know, the, the, the military way of doing things, that's, that's not how, how it is anymore. And, exactly. and rightfully so for, for, for most reasons. So, yes, you got it. Yep. <laughs> So we're talking about a minute ago about, you know, these companies that these, you know, graduating seniors are going to work for. It's no real surprise. You hear about it, talk about it all the time, no matter what article you're looking at. But always talking about, you know, there's the, it's been the skilled labor gap forever, right? There's not enough skilled laborers. There's not enough welders. All this has been going on forever. We start seeing these numbers like, I, I, I've quoted this like three times. I know I've got it wrong. But the AGC, AGC put out sometime in like the last six months. They're like 91% of the contractors can't find enough project managers and these sort of things. So obviously there's gotta be a big demand on basically these graduating seniors, I, I can imagine. From your perspective and you know, working with these students all the time, what can companies do to kind of attract maybe and try to get a leg up and try to attracting and getting the, the graduating seniors to go look at them? Yeah, what, what I've seen that's working the best is they're getting to those students earlier. Right, they're, those are the students they're bringing in as freshmen and they're trying to keep them as interns for four years um, because we cannot produce enough graduates right now for the people who come recruit at Ferris. Uh, we're at you know 100% or near 100% employment out of school uh, since I've been there. And um, the, the best recruiters are getting them early. I've even talked to some who are going to high school trade center programs. Um, wow both on the trade side and saying, hey, if you're going to college, you know, think of this route and trying to push them in that direction too. Um, but it's across the board. It's not, like you said, not just trades, it's the PMs, it's superintendents, it's estimators, it's every position in there. Um, the salaries have gone up quite a bit. I see what some of these students coming out of school are making. I'm like, geez, do I want to teach anymore? I can go make some money. <laughs> But yeah, they're they're trying to get creative. Uh, some are they're out back to signing bonuses now, things like that. Relocation fees for students coming out of college. Wow! And I think back. I graduated college in two thousand eight, right in the middle of that downturn. Um, and I think I had something like four job offers, and three of them got pulled last minute because of the economic conditions. They had hiring freezes at the time. It's completely different than what's happening right now. That's the way it was when I graduated in 2010. I was class of 2009, but graduated in 10. And um, well, it took me five years to get out of school. But like my roommate, he was a finance major, something like that. And anyway, he was 
he basically stayed another year because he couldn't find a job. So he stayed yeah. another year and got like an international business certificate or something like that. Basically stayed another year so we could play rugby another year and, and hang out, but he couldn't find work. So he just stayed and got another certificate. But that's what, uh, there was a guy, he was kind of like the godfather of our university, of our civil engineering program. He'd been there since they built the school, I think. He was kind of this old guy, but he was, he kind of always like the big mentor, always helped everybody out. And he was like, you guys don't understand, like, you know, 10 years ago, five, even five years ago, you know, for every graduate we had each graduate had like five offers whenever they graduated and now today there might be one offer per five students or something like that and it was i mean you just prayed you got something and so you just you got lucky yeah. you're happy you took what you got so it's, it's been interesting in my 13 year short pretty short career to see the see the trends and stuff and and hopefully it, it stays this way for a while i hope so yeah we'll see what happens everyone's predicting a recession but there's a lot of money getting pumped into well, I say yeah. they're predicting a recession. They've been doing it for a long time. I saw somebody say, "No, no, no, we're already in a recession." They yeah. haven't called it that yet. So, and then construction is still going strong right now, though. So, <laughs> it's yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, it yeah. sure is. I, I've just heard. I mean, I keep hearing about projects that are getting released later this year and even into next year, and it's just not slowing down. It's actually picking up. It seems like in my sector. So, yeah. Um, and one other thing I'll add on the students. We're also seeing a bit of a trend because we have an associate's degree that goes into our bachelor's degree. We've got more and more students leaving with their associates because they can go get a job right now with that two-year mm -hmm. degree rather than just a four-year degree. I, I try and advise them. I'm like, that works today, but next that downturn hits, you're probably one of the first ones getting let go compared to a person with a bachelor's degree, unless you prove yourself head and shoulders above somebody else. But uh, that's a trend I'm seeing. That's interesting. Very. Very interesting. Does that, I mean, does that shape at all what you guys try to do with the curriculum then? Do you try to change around the first two years based on that or um, that could be, be tough? I, th I think our curriculum is set up pretty good actually yeah. with that in consideration because our first two years tends to focus on more of the, the technical and the hands-on side of things. So those people leaving after two years wind up going more for that in-field kind of perspective anyway. And our second two years, I get the bachelor's degree is more the business side of things, your scheduling mm -hmm. classes, my economics class, kind of those higher level project management stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. That's cool. Going back to the technology and stuff, you're talking about you got a lot of students coming back from internships and bringing you technology. You know, aside from the, is there anything cool that you're seeing coming in that, you know, it's not, not the BIM modeling, not the stuff you see every day that's um, that may actually be making an impact soon, you know, because there's stuff like, you know, virtual reality, which I don't think it's going to be a really make an impact for a decade if it ever does. It's kind of a cool thing, but I would say some more of that, like robotic layout or automated layout stuff. I'm, I'm hearing more companies using that. My interns actually get to see that being done on job sites with, you know, tolerances that are acceptable out in the construction field. So that's, I think that technology is getting better to a point where it's going to be more useful and automated machinery, a lot, lot more automated machinery out there right now too. Yeah. I've seen that on, you know, they call them robot welders, but I guess, it, I guess it's a robot and it's not, it's not on a running around welding stuff. It's just kind of stationary and stuff. Yeah. But it's an arm or whatever, but yeah. 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 But even that stuff's pretty cool. You know, especially yeah. if you're doing prefabrication and getting into the prefabrication, going back to the MEP stuff. You know, if you got a bunch of pipe welding to do and you can basically just set the robot up and let them go, that solves a, a big labor problem. Definitely. Well, I, unless I'm mistaken, I see a little bit of that in, in the dirt world too, in compactors. And, oh, yeah. And, you know, seeing quite a bit of those robotics. So, yeah, GPS guided grading yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. Have you seen the, like, the remote controlled excavators? Um, I haven't personally. It's been more I mean, of the, uh, grading or compacting side of things um and they're automated less remote they're just going on a program at that point um but yeah that would be i would want to play with one that'd be fun <laughs> I, saw, I saw a video online and it was basically a remote control it was actually two it was like a guy was like sitting because if you got an excavator like in a dangerous area maybe get caved in or something they got the excavator out there and he's sitting over here on a remote control watching it almost like grabbing an rc car or something but that's it was fantastic. massive excavator and there was also another one was a guy was like sitting in a warehouse in like say Arizona and he was driving a, an excavator in Minnesota. Right. And like just doing like the little simulator, but it's actually doing the excavator. Like, this is crazy. That's awesome. Let's start outsourcing our excavators overseas or something. <laughs> yeah. And I guess along with that, I've been hearing quite a bit about like remote inspections, drone based inspections. 
um, oh, on the yeah. utility side a lot too. Uh, it used to be helicopter flyovers. Now they're doing a lot of inspections with cameras on drones. I've seen that too, where they'll, they'll basically get a little robot and they'll send it up the pipe and you can do an inspection you know, from the inside of the pipes and stuff. So. Yep. It's crazy. So, you know, what are maybe some misconceptions your students have maybe around the MEP world, you know, when they're coming in and uh, working on? Um, I would say it's more of just a lack of understanding on the complexity of some of those systems rather than a misunderstanding. It's they they don't know what they don't know yet. And uh, it, it kind of scares them at first, almost like. They, they know that electricity, like, for example, can be dangerous, but then I like do a, a lecture on electrical safety and we talk about arc flash and their eyes just get huge. <laughs> it's like, yes, this is the stuff you need to worry about on a job site. Um, so after that one, nobody wants to wire up their tabletop circuit. <laughs> so I thought, We're not having arc flash concerns here, but <laughs> so I think it's that that just kind of almost shock and awe because um, the only thing they've ever thought of a building or a construction project being is like we said earlier dirt and structure that's well that's a really good point and and not even touching on the safety side of things but like as, as a as former electrician my one of my things my biggest thing i learned on the job site was like welding and piping you know watching those welders put in you know st sticks of 10 inch diameter pipe and watch them do multiple passes that takes a whole day to finish that one well i mean when you really actually see that in person that's what's like okay wow this is uh this is an art this is yes uh, this is industrial world things are not done quickly here they're done right because i've also seen those projects where we had entire um, engine rooms of welds that took months to put in and then it all got ripped out because the welds didn't pass the inspections <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's a bad day on site <laughs> <laughs> that just makes me cringe. Yeah. yeah. Watching it all go in and watching it all come back out. Right. Yeah, that's that's a rough day. <laughs> yeah. But but just, just back to your point, I mean, until you actually kind of see those things and really get the understanding for the and, and appreciate it, it's just yep. you, you, you don't even understand, you know, you don't know what you don't know. That's the best yep. way to it. And stories like that are what students respond to the most. They want to hear what you saw in the field and something real life, not just out of a textbook, but um, I'll oftentimes, you know, use an example I had on one job site where we had some equipment being delivered um, and it hit an overpass in Carmel, Indiana. <laughs> and, okay, there's a, a $10 million piece of equipment that we were gonna install the next day. And now well, what does my lead time look like? What did that just do to my schedule? So I, we use that as an example of, you can plan everything you want and a project can be going well, and one truck driver's mistake can throw the whole project off track now at that point. So what do you do? How do you overcome something like that? And that creative problem solving that has to occur at that point. It's hard to, to teach, but you can put them in those scenarios based on past experiences, and they kind of think that way a little bit then at that point. That's interesting because right now, I mean, everyone knows the lead times are crazy, right? What used to take 10 weeks to get a generator is taking 52 weeks or, you know, it's just wild right now. Do yeah. y'all talk about, I guess you talk about what's happening in the real world right now and talk about kind of those uh, we do alternate plans and creative planning and sort of stuff. Yep. So we talk about that as faculty um, eat with each other and then also bring that to our class. But a lot of times we'll bring you know, current people who are out in the field as guest lectures, like Kyle, you've guest lectured for my power plants and process plant class one yeah. time. We try and bring some of those current perspectives in too right now, people working in the field. And there's a lot of us who also work over the summer as either consultants on projects um, or we get out into different projects as a kind of a advisory role, whatever it might be, to bring some of those experiences in too. We try and stay as current as we can. Oh my gosh, that's pretty cool. Because especially right now, the whole landscape's changing so fast. Yeah, I, what you're, I what you're teaching this year could be out of date next year. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. Uh, I, I can't remember who it was, but we we're talking about switch gear lead times right now, and somebody said they had something quoted for seventy eight weeks. Yeah, and I was like, holy cow! How do you plan around that? <laughs> you know, you got to like. I've seen people be creative like that, right? Like we're. You know, we've had to order project come on. We had to order some of the electrical gear before we even hired the contractor. Really, just got it on order and just yeah. kind of designed around this. Like, this is what we got coming. Yeah. 
And so you just kind of, you know, pin that and then just kind of com complete your design and keep moving because you guys got to yeah. get it. You got to get it in line, you know? Right. It's a, it's a whole different ball game today. So when your kids are going through school, um, are most of them coming out wanting to work for a general contractor or do any of them come out wanting to work for a trade contractor? Kind of, you know, because you've got superintendents and you've got project managers really in both routes, right? The subs and the GC. So is there more leaning towards one or the other? I would say the majority of our students go towards that GC route. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to push more and more of them to that trade contractor saying, hey, you know, sometimes there's higher margins on these subcontractors and you can make some good money there too. Um, it feels less and, competitive too. Well, yes, yep. So I'm I'm seeing more students now that they understand that those opportunities are there. They're not just thinking a general contractor, they're going towards that route. So some of it's exposure, some of it goes back to, they're still kind of scared of it even after taking my classes. Um, because, I mean, you think of all the 120-some credits we have in the program, only two classes are dedicated to MEP. Um, it's still smaller. It's better than it was, right? Before we kind of developed this new curriculum, there was only one class. So we're kind of expanding it. Um, but they still gravitate towards that general contractor. I do see it as the students who really get into what I'm teaching them. They tend to go towards that trade contractor um, because they found a an interest in it. They've got a passion for it now. Um, but it's across all kinds of industries too. We have students go residential. We have most of our students probably go commercial um, and then some towards that more industrial route too. Uh, so it's a, a wide mix of where our students wind up. That's pretty cool. Um, I mean, I ended up in a subcontractor because one, I, I just took what I could get, right? Um, I started working for more of a civil contractor first and I learned project management basics, you know, I learned, I learned what submittal was, and I learned what an RFI was, and I learned how to manage a project and learned, you know, budgeting and those sort of things kind of on the, basically by doing. And then I left there and I was going to work for a mechanical and plumbing subcontractor, the project manager. And I remember interviewing with the president and he asked me, he's like, something, something, could you size a chiller if I gave you the parameters? And I was like, dude, I don't even know what a chiller is. <laughs> <laughs> and I was honest with him and he was like, well, I appreciate your honesty and like we can teach you the trade side of stuff. You understand the project management side of stuff. So I guess I'm just saying that's like anybody out there who may be looking to make a change or something or maybe going from a general contractor and you don't know the specifics. If you understand the project management basics, you can learn the trade stuff. Um, yeah, you got a little bit of learning curve to do, right? But like you can you still make the change. Yeah, that's perfect example. I keep telling them at the end of the day, if you watch your scope, your schedule, and your budget, you're going to get through a project. But the more you know about the technical details and you're really willing to dig into those details, the better your project's probably going to be. But you got your basics down, you can go anywhere. Yeah. Do you guys get much time in your curriculum to go into, um, you know, the different, we put a lot of focus in the different phases of construction too. So, you know, a lot of pre-construction planning versus just, just the field work with the oversight and, you know, handling the day-to-day -day versus like commissioning. Like, like how does that fit in the curriculum? I mean, I can imagine it's pretty tight trying to get all that stuff in there. It is, yeah. Uh, the bulk of it probably focuses on the construction piece. Yeah. Um, but from the pre-con side, um, we've got like two estimating classes. Um, so you're you're teaching the first one. It's basic QTO, quantity takeoff kind of stuff. The second one's more of a conceptual estimating. So that's kind of more that pre-con route. Um, you're doing some of that early project scoping and things like that. On the technology side, we cover those pre-con topics, um, especially from the modeling, right? Build the building twice, once virtually, once in real life. Um, and then in my stuff, I try and hit more on the commissioning side of things. Um, there's not a whole lot of other places we hit on the commissioning. I'm looking honestly at developing a commissioning class as an elective for our seniors. Um, mm -hmm. Something that's on tap for the summer, so I don't get to do nothing over the summer, but I can do it out of my camper up in the UP. Yeah, not so. bad. Not <laughs> bad. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Well, and, and, and I wanted to ask because, I mean, kind of what I'm seeing, I feel like, is a trend in, in my sector in manufacturing is I'm seeing, um, the. I feel like the better cm's getting more involved with pre-construction planning and i'm seeing the owners be more uh, open to the idea too and because i think that they're finally starting to realize the earlier you plan you know in theory the better your project can go um and so 
you know, there's so much value in it. And especially um, with the trends and with how, with how much attention it's starting to get, I feel like finally, um, it just, you know, I was curious about uh, how you guys fit that in. So yeah. Like, yeah. And part of that comes down to how are these owners structuring their project, right? What kind of delivery method do you have? And I remember hearing about integrated project delivery for the first time. And it's like, at the time I was like, well, who in their right mind would trust the contractor that early? And <laughs> yeah, right. that method or mindset has completely swapped. There's a lot more people going that route now. Um, Cause I think a lot of that trust is getting built out in the industry right now. Um, and that can, yeah, change that planning dimension drastically. And that's what I've seen too, is a lot of the way the economy's been, you know, there's not a whole lot of contractors wanting to do low bid, hard bid. It's just too much risk for them. So a lot of them are going the route of, uh, you know, like a CM at risk type thing or a design build, which also brings them in earlier, right? Brings them into yep. the design phase. So uh, are you guys doing, you know, you talked about doing some of that pre-construction stuff, but do y'all talk through kind of design phases and kind of that constructability type of stuff early on of what, of what a general contractor or a contractor would be a part of in that design phase? Yeah, that, that winds up being more in like our second two years when we get to those business kind of things. We have a dedicated contracts class. We talk a lot about those project delivery methods there and in that capstone class too. Um, you know, what does this, yeah, it's words on paper for a contract, but what does that actually translate to in execution of this project? What's your role in each of these different methods that are out there? So it, it takes them a little bit to kind of grasp some of them, but uh, the examples again there can really help drive home kind of the pros and cons of those different options. Yeah, value def- engineer- I was gonna say, do you right. value engineering? Oh, we, we touch on value engineering. I think at one point in the program's history, we had a dedicated value engineering class, oh, wow. um, but that was moved away to, you know, there's only so many credits in four years. So we kind of had to swap some stuff around too. Um, but yeah, we, we touch on those topics too. That's cool. That's one of the most, misconstrued terms i think out there because I, I wrote about it in my newsletter but like a lot of people just like say value engineering is like okay instead of building a six-story building we're gonna build a five-story building get you back in the budget like that's value engineering like no it's not value engineering you can't go cut out square foot like that's not right. how it works yep so yeah well i think we've we've, we've made a few uh random we started mep and kind of made the gamut uh, you guys got anything else you want to touch on or? Um, I just want to say thanks again. I appreciate this opportunity. It was good chatting with you guys. Yeah, no, it's been great. And um, yeah, man, I'm just trying to think of any, any burning questions I have. I mean, we, we talked about a lot of stuff here. Um, I know did. I wasn't trying to cut it short. <laughs> uh, it's been 46 minutes. You know, time flies. Um, man, it's been a good conversation. It's actually cool because I feel like I'm so out of touch with what's happening in colleges today. It's like you graduate, you go on, you go out to the, the real world, you know, and you don't really know what they're teaching, right? And you may go talk to an intern or something, but like you don't really understand. Yeah. It's and like I said earlier, like, our our program, uh, I didn't even know something like this, like this existed when I went to college. Um, and we've had one version or another of it since the 60s, I think. Um, back then it was just a two-year degree, more of a hands-on thing. Uh, but it's developed for a long time and a uh, small little school up in Michigan has a big impact, you know, on a lot of these students that go through. I think we've got like 270 students right now in the program. So, and we cannot fill the industry's need that comes to recruit for us right now. So it's, it was eye opening uh, when I started, you know, really researching and meeting some of these people that had graduated from this program in in the industry when I was working. Um, that led me to teach here eventually. Do you have any clue nationwide, like how many graduating construction management seniors are every year out of all the universities and colleges and stuff? I don't know. There's there's probably a, a lot because I'm thinking of all the different schools I know. I've got yeah. colleagues that I chat with at all these places. Some of the big ones like Arizona State or Auburn, uh, they produce a lot more graduates than we do a year. But uh, it seems like every state's got a couple construction management programs out there 100 percent. that's what i was just thinking through it because like i mean you guys are pumping out 270 and these bigger colleges are pumping out thousands and like we still yeah. can't meet the demand in yeah, the it's probably the thousands or tens of thousands every year yeah, yeah that's a well it's gonna be really interesting to see um 
over the next you know five ten years um just from the uh, standpoint of i feel like right now i don't see that many that are in the field that are you know the 10 15 year guys that are leading that have construction management degrees so it's going to be really exciting and i'm i, I mean I'm, I'm excited for the industry to see what that's what that's like when all these all these new graduates are getting those leadership roles and kind of see yeah. how things how things go and what what it looks like it's going to be way different definitely i want to ask you if you got like one piece of advice kind of for that next generation no matter what it is kind of from your perspective because you see a lot of people you deal with a lot of probably companies coming in recruiting all that sort of stuff if you if you just had to give like one piece of advice to somebody in the next generation what would you do what would you say Ooh, i Put think on the spot. yeah or a few pieces are fine <laughs> i think the, the biggest one and when I, if i think of the students i've had that have done the best they were curious. They they aren't afraid to ask questions, admit what they don't know, and they weren't afraid to dig in and figure it out for themselves and get that stuff done. So I think that that curious nature is important when you get out there because so many people are okay just kind of sitting back and going with the flow. But if you dig in and try and try and understand whatever it is you're doing, if you ask those questions, you're going to be way better at what you're doing. And the people above you are going to, I think, respect you all that much more um, because they see you trying in a very active way to, to figure it out. So that, I guess that would be my advice. Be curious. We've gone full circle back to Marty again, Matt. I mean, that's the same thing we were talking about was, you know, uh, being willing to put yourself out there, challenge yourself, be uncomfortable, um, do those things that kind of, you know, they stretch you and they get you to that next level. That's great. It's funny. We keep going around in circles. I guess it's, I guess it means it's all true. Yeah, that's right. The truth it's comes fun. out eventually. So I've got five year old twin boys, and they're going to be starting kindergarten in the fall. And we actually went to this uh, STEM program introduction class, like to see if we wanted to join the STEM program. And I was like, this is really cool. Like we're going to join the lottery. It's like a lottery program, but but they were talking about like they're teaching them at that age, really through all through elementary school, of like the iterative process of like and being comfortable with failing, right? They have these like STEM, these, uh, what do you call it? This is an engineering thing with like design a windmill, right? And if it fails, they say, okay, well, why did it fail? What did it do? How are you gonna fix it? And go into that mindset of like, and instead of just, it failed and give up, you know? And I feel like it's such a cool thing where they're starting to teach five-year-olds, six-year-olds, 10-year-olds that, because I know it's too many people that for whatever reason, the way that they were taught growing up now that it's like it fails and they're they're afraid to fail they're afraid to be curious they're afraid of trying new things because they're afraid of that happening so it's, it's really cool to see that trickling all the way down into kindergarten that's awesome yeah and i try and give my that message to my students too i'm like you're never going to get it right the first time um you got to keep trying that's the aspect of that where you just don't give up and failure isn't the end of the world it's just the first step it means you learn something yeah. So. Cool, man. Brian, if anybody wants to chat with you or anything, can they get in touch with you? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, I provided my LinkedIn. Uh, you can get there. Or if you go to ferris.edu, um, my contact information is listed under the faculty section for the construction management department, too. Cool, man. Well, Great. unless you guys got anything else, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Sounds good. No, really enjoyed it, Brian. Thanks a lot for coming on. Yes, you guys, too. Thanks. Good I appreciate question. it. I, uh, I learned a lot today, honestly. <laughs> That's Brian, my job as a professor, so I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you get an A. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't turn in my homework, so don't give me that. <laughs> you and half the other students. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I get an extension, please? <laughs> yeah. A lot of those emails. <laughs> oh, Especially this time of year, I'm sure. Uh -huh. Uh, or, or you get the at the last week of the class. What can I do to make my grade better? Oh yeah, <laughs> get a time machine. <laughs> oh yeah. I don't envy you right now, man. Uh, so. It's all good though. It lets me do what I like. So. Uh, awesome. <laughs> well, again, I appreciate it, Brian. It's good to meet you. Yeah. You too. Talk to you later. Thanks. <laughs>